Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk with you this morning. In my three minutes, what I want to talk to you a little bit about is complementary and alternative medicine. And what I find even more interesting is new ways to study things that I hope are relevant beyond that area and generally relevant to clinical research. So why CAM, why complementary and alternative medicine is a question that I get asked fairly regularly, particularly as a pediatrician. And I think to me it is because when we talk about value, and in particular our patients' values, their preferences, their beliefs, that's where this comes up. This isn't an agenda driven by the healthcare profession or researchers, I think. It's very much driven by our patients, their interests, their values, what they want to do for their own health. And so that's where this starts. I would like to ask you a question that I love to ask audiences, uh, which is how many Canadians, what percent of Canadians do you think use complementary and alternative medicine? And by that I mean products, so homeopathic remedies, fish oils, probiotics, vitamins, minerals, what have you, or practices, going to the chiropractor, the naturopath, the massage therapist. So I'll give you a percentage, you put up your hand. What percentage of Canadians use complementary and alternative medicine? 10%, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. So Health Canada estimates that 70% of Canadians use CAM. The rates are phenomenally high, which then means why CAM? Because it's relevant to most patients I see. The two questions that we get asked most often are, does it work and is it safe? Okay, so how do we answer those questions? And in particular, I think what uh, studying CAM has taught me is that there's a willingness to study outside the box, even in terms of research methods. So we'll start with, is it safe? If you're not sure if a therapy works, most people can tolerate that. Most patients, most healthcare providers can live with the idea of, I can't guarantee this therapy will work for you, but the uncertainty around safety is not tolerable. And again, I put to you, that's for any therapy, not just for complementary therapies. If you're not sure if something is safe, it's an untenable position. So our national approach, and it's not unique to Health Canada, it is what Canada, the US, the FDA, the EU, Australia, the, the national standard for harms reporting with regards to product is what's called passive surveillance. So I have another question for you. What percentage of serious drug-related adverse events do you think get reported to Health Canada? And by serious, I mean it kills you, it puts you in hospital, or it leaves you with a permanent lasting morbidity. This time I'll give you numbers backwards. You raise your hand. What percent of serious adverse events get reported? So 100%. 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. One in nine. So given that passive surveillance grossly underestimates both the quantity and quality of those harms for us to make sense of them, our team has invested a fair amount of effort into active surveillance of asking every patient seen. And so we've partnered with Health Canada, we've been in three provinces now, and surveyed some 3,500 consumers. Given the particular area of interest for our program, what we asked about are patients who take their natural health products, their vitamins, minerals, and so on, with their prescription medicines. And what we found is if you actively ask every patient seen, you can improve harms reporting 3,000 times in comparison to passive surveillance. So we're quite excited by the approach where we're taking that nexus into the community in partnership, uh, we're getting out of community pharmacies and this time working with providers that provide spinal manipulation therapy. So that would be chiropractors, physicians, physical therapists, osteopaths with an idea of measuring safety to try and get prospective data on adverse events. The last piece I want to leave you with is the question of does it work? So the gold standard in clinical research are randomized controlled trials. They're a beautiful thing, we do them. I'm not against trials, but trials generate group data. No patient is a group. What you can lose within a trial is that the individual gets better, gets worse, or stays the same. The way we treat trial data is as an average. We assume that everyone in the group had that same mean benefit, and most people don't react that way to therapy. And people truly want to know for them, does this therapy work? It's a common question for their healthcare provider as well, because when they, they're working very hard to stay up to date, they're reading everything they can, 
but the best quality trials out there typically are not reflective of general community practice. They don't most often include patients that have comorbid disease, that have concurrent therapies. Patients that get excluded from research are the patients we see in real life. And so there is this thing called N of one trials. N being the sample size, one being the patient. And it's the opportunity to rigorously study for that individual patient, does this therapy work or not? And the way that you do that is in an on-off, on-off. So you can randomize, you can blind, and you can rigorously assess. So we take the benefits of what we know about clinical research and apply it in clinical practice. And so that's something that, again, our team is very excited about and has spent a fair amount of energy sort of exploring. We think it's not uniquely relevant to CAM. We think it's important to evaluate therapies in patients. And as we heard yesterday, to discontinue therapies that are ineffective. So not only should we rigorously assess them when we start the therapy, but periodically, I believe we should reevaluate all therapies patients are on to see if we're still getting the benefit that we had hoped for when we first initiated it. So for our team, those general questions of value, impact, and relevance, uh, we hope to achieve, one, by asking patient-centered questions, and two, looking at methods that we think are generalizable beyond the specific area that we study. Thank you.